I'd like to start with a prayer from um, Saint or from Pope Francis um, encyclical Laudate Si on care for our common home. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace us with your tenderness. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters harming no one. <clears throat> o God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who, took, who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature. As we journey towards your infinite light, we thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. So I'm Steve Mulder. I'm today representing the uh, Church of the Servants Creation Care Team and also the Climate Witness Project. So if you're interested in uh, knowing more about either of those, please let me know. We're doing this uh, meeting um, under the auspices of GPS, God's People Seeking. So I want to especially thank um, Annette Ediger and um, Dave Hartwell for supporting us. Well, with this project, but also just in general, they've just been wonderful supports for all the work that we do. So just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, at Church of the Servant, I guess we've now been around for almost 50 years. It's hard, hard to believe that. But we've looked at um, burial practices in the past and wondered about um, the various options and what's the right way to do um, interment. At one point, we were looking into uh, building a columbarium for ashes. And um, a couple of years ago, the creation care team started looking into green burial. And we actually were thinking about, is it possible for us to bury um, the dead of our church right on the church property? And it turned out that, yeah, it actually is possible and it's actually legal, but it's also kind of fraught and there's a lot of, a lot of challenges with doing that. And so then at that time, we, we discovered that there was a, um, one option for green burial in uh, West Michigan, which is the Ridgeview um, Memorial Gardens. And that's run by a guy named Ron Zartman, who some of you may know. And I know some of the, some of the church, uh, members of the Church of the Servant have already purchased plots in their green burial, um, their green burial garden, which is an operating hay field. So anyway, uh, 50 years ago when we started, I don't know what the statistics were, but I'm sure most of the burials that were done from the Church of the Servant were um, traditional um, American burials. Since that time, um, cremation has become the most popular or most common way of um, internment. So now, um, as of I think five or six years ago, creation overtook burial of any kind. And so more than half of the of, uh, of internment is, is handled through crema cremation now. So, um, you know, we've done a lot of reading, we've done a lot of talking, we're, we're very interested in the various options. I don't think anybody is gonna say, this is the right way to do internment or this is the Christian way to do it, but rather, you know, what are the options and what are the implications for the different, different ways of doing it? So a couple of months ago, uh, one of my daughters um, turned me on to uh, Peter and Annika Quakenbush and their project, which is called MI Burial. And they have a very cool project that they're working on. I, I said, uh, I attached a link to that and some of you may have had a chance to look at that. If not, you can look at it later, but I'm, I'm hoping that they'll tell us, um, you know, what Green Burial is all about and then also about their project. So I'm not gonna uh, introduce them any further. I'd rather let them introduce themselves and share whatever they wanna share about themselves with you. Um, in terms of questions, if you have questions as we go, if it's something that's kind of burning and you really wanna get it out there, uh, just unmute yourself and, and ask your question. But otherwise, just put it in the chat and I'll be looking at the, watching the chat and then at the end of their presentation, we'll uh, go through all the questions that you had. Okay, that's it for me. So I'll turn it over to the Quaking Bushes. All right, thank you, Steve. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm Annika, this is Peter. And what would we say about introduction stuff? I'm a birth doula and birth photographer and Peter is finishing up a PhD in botany. So he's a botanist, all around plant person, <laughs> um, a little obsessive maybe. 
Anyway, I wanted to also give you the little caveat that we are child care less this morning. We're on lockdown, um, quarantine, whatever, because we were exposed. So um, I may be in and out with our kids because we have two little ones, four and one. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. First, we're going to talk about green burial, and then we'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, but to start off, Peter is going to give some prehistoric and historic context about cemeteries and burial. Um, it sounds more boring than it is, I hope. So bear with those first couple minutes and then we'll get to the good stuff. Go ahead. All right. So, yes, as advertised, green burial. And Annika has not actually heard what I'm going to say, so she doesn't know. <laughs> so I might be interjecting. <laughs> But I want to first start by asking, uh, I guess, a rhetorical question of, do you know what is going to happen to you after you die? And, you know, that sounds like maybe a fairly normal question that you could uh, ask in a church setting like this. But, of course, I'm not talking about your soul. I'm being much more literal than that. I am talking about your actual body. <laughs> do you know um, what's going to happen to your body after you die? And this is something that we as humans have had to deal with uh, basically since the beginning. So um, that's a good place to start, or at least closer to that. So last year published in Nature, in, in some circles, I guess it would have made uh, bigger news than others, but in the continent of Africa, they discovered the earliest known intentional human burial. And that was of a small child in Kenya from about 80,000 years ago. But there's actually evidence of uh, human burial um, in Eurasia from about 120,000 years ago. And if you go to South Africa, there's a cave um, and a different hominin called Homo naledi was uh, supposedly caching their dead um, about 230 to 330,000 years ago. And evidence even goes beyond that to, but over to Spain, there's another cave where um, humans in the Neanderthal lineage were caching their dead possibly as early as 400,000 years ago. So clearly this is a, a very historical <laughs> uh, solution to the, that question of, you know, what should we do with our dead after, after the, we're no longer using those bodies anymore. Um, but let's zoom forward several hundred thousand years to a little bit more <laughs> of a contemporary uh, context, but still colonial era in America. And uh, this is pictures from St. Peter's churchyard in Philadelphia. I haven't been there, but it represents kind of that area pretty well. Essentially graveyards were on the properties of churches and they weren't necessarily designed. Um, nature was obviously there, but it was not really an intentional part of it. And um, they just kind of filled up with an assortment of headstones and such. And these fairly quickly filled up. And as the population grew, cities expanded. Um, there was a lot of fear of kind of urban contagion, epidemics and stuff. Something needed to be done. So really in the about 1800s, kind of the next um, evolution of the, the cemetery in America is, is what can be called the, the rural cemetery. So these were pressed out to the kind of the borders of the cities, the rural areas. These were intentionally designed, uh, typically around nature, um, landscaped places. They really formed some of the first parks or landscaped public places that people had access to. Um, and they were fairly central in society. So this is kind of like the heyday of cemeteries <laughs> in America. Um, they weren't very full at that time. They were picturesque. They had events, uh, parades, picnics, that sort of things. Some of them were kind of um, designed around this grid system, sort of like the cities that were developing. Some of them had a much more um, rural feel to them, like curvy, curvy paths, which, which you can see here. These are both recent photos from about this era in uh, Grand Rapids cemeteries, but they, they incorporated topography, trees, and, and that sort of thing. Um, 
Another prominent feature of these was kind of the, the family memorial. So these were often large and uh, sort of competing amongst each other for <laughs> bigger and grander um, areas. And there was just a, a whole assortment of them. So not, not really standardized, but you got to do what you, you wanted to do. And then also during this time, especially around the, the Civil War era, when um, many American soldiers needed to be sent home and preserved, embalming really started to become a, a common practice. And for example, Abraham Lincoln was, was bombed, it was embalmed. Um, but these two began to fill up and though they had once been rural, now many of them were kind of surrounded by struggling inner cities and um, many Americans had moved further out into the suburbs um, and so we have the development of, here we go, the, the modern cemetery, which kind of developed in the 1900s. And a lot, a lot was happening in this time. But um, what kind of stands out here in, in stark contrast is instead of having these headstones all over and all these um, family monuments, individualistic, um, there's kind of this institutional monument and then around it, there are all these, um, which you can't even see under the snow. There's all these individual markers, which is kind of the, the bare minimum. They're uh, like flat, the flat gravestones. They're, they're flush with the ground, yeah. And typically this is in a lawn scape, which was kind of the aesthetic of the time. Um, but also during this time, lots of stuff was happening. So Aldo Leopold had expressed his land ethic uh, Rachel Carson had written her book on um, Silent Spring, which basically detailed the effects of pesticides, particularly DDT. There was the environmental movement well, well underway and um, kind of this emerging environmental sensibility. But in addition to that, um, kind of symbolized by this institutional monument here, much of this process that had kind of been in, in the realm of the family had been sort of professionalized and, and moved away. Um, additionally, before many people died young. So like children, babies, um, people kind of in the prime of their life. And many people still maintained their relationship kind of with these people af after they died by visiting cemeteries, spending lots of time in cemeteries. But as people began to die older, the majority of people, the kind of more common sequence was maybe moving to the nursing home when you're old, and then from there to the hospital, and then from the hospital to the funeral home, and then from the funeral home to the cemetery. And then even in the cemetery, um, with a much more secularized population, a much more mobile population, not nearly as um, connected to land. Um, a lot of changing cultural views around the cemetery and especially with these environmental aspects, kind of a lot of layers. So before it was just kind of, you get buried in the churchyard and, and everything was natural and that's how it was. But now there's environmental things to consider. There's kind of changing cultural things to <laughs> consider. Um, including some, um, cremation, which Steve mentioned. So in 1960, there were fewer than 4% of Americans who were cremated. And now, actually a few years ago, that passed 50%. And in about 10 years, it's estimated to be close to 75%. And um, that's probably just going to continue. So if you look at... Uh, highly developed countries that are pretty densely populated like Japan or Taiwan, basically everyone there is cremated. So really the role of the cemetery kind of in American culture was being questioned for many reasons. And the, the pendulum was kind of swinging from the totally institutionalized, professionalized back towards the more natural movement. So there was like natural birth movement, natural foods movement, natural life movement, <laughs> natural death movement, and um, uh, kind of in, in the UK at first, in the 80s and 90s, a natural burial movement, um, which is where we kind of come onto the scene. But first, let's talk a little bit about some of the specific environmental costs of 
what we can call conventional burial. So uh, here's some numbers that get thrown around, around fairly often. It's from a 2015 study. So this is what um, might be average for that year in America, but 30 million board feet of hardwood goes into the caskets, about 1.6 million tons of concretes, concrete, um, making the vaults that kind of um, go around the caskets and are placed into the ground so that the ground doesn't subside and, and make it hard to mow. About 800,000 gallons of toxic embalming fluid, and then over 100,000 tons of steel as well. So fairly resource intensive. And if, if you were to like take a step back and, and compare these to the relative usage of all these things, it would be fairly small, but still not insignificant. Um, another uh, thing I wanna point out, which was kind of interesting, this is a map of all the graveyards, uh, including cemeteries in the US. And there's a little dot for every location that was known in the US and it's not really to scale. So like if, if you were to put a dot, the actual size of all the cemeteries, like a lot of them wouldn't actually show up at this scale, <laughs> but it, it does show like how many cemeteries there are. And, and it does give you an idea of how much space is actually taken up by these cemeteries, which is another concern. Um, if you have essentially all this landscape that is being maintained through you know, mowing and, and largely chemical means, that's, um, that really is a major cont contribution to America's largest crop, which is the lawn. So some places like CUS are, are doing something about that and growing native plants, which is, which is pretty cool. But um, cemeteries are a big part of that as well. Um, so some details now about cremation, since that really is the trend, uh, the way things are going and will likely continue to go. But cremation originally was, at least in the, in the, the late 60s and stuff, was kind of advertised as this um, more environmentally friendly alternative. And it, it definitely is, in, in many regards, more environmentally friendly, but it is also reliant, pretty heavily reliant on fossil fuels. So kind of you're reliant on these fossil fuels all the way up through the end. Um, because it really does take a lot of energy to incinerate a body and um, basically turn it into air. So most of that goes out of the chimney um, in the form of CO2. And then uh, some of that is also mercury from like dental amalgams that, uh, and maybe surprised to, to hear this, but these are still used today. So um, again, if you compared like total CO2 emissions from cremations to everything else and mercury and that sort of stuff, it's, it doesn't score real highly. But again, these are kind of negative impacts that could be done better. So to put things into a little bit of perspective, we have, um, it would take a tree growing for more than 10 years to really recapture that CO2 that was produced by a single cremation. So maybe plant a tree with your cremated remains and let it go for 10 years and then that kind of solves it. <laughs> but um, there can be advances in this, in this area. Like you can use maybe more sustainable fuels or there is something called aquamation, which instead of using fire to incinerate the body, uses a liquid solution that's highly basic to essentially dissolve the body. So instead of going out the chimney, most of you go down, goes down the drain. Um, and then you're left with the hard parts like the, the bones and those are ground. And then essentially you have your cremated remains as well. And this is said to be about 90% um, more efficient than kind of traditional cremation. And it's, it's available, or at least it's legal now in about 50% of US states. And, and this is kind of becoming more and more um, prevalent. It's my understanding that there's nothing illegal about it in Michigan, but no, nobody's really doing it here yet. You can do it for pets, but nobody has um, really started that service for, for people. <laughs> um, but a little bit of a comparison back to burial. So conventional burial on one side and versus green burial, which is this umbrella term, um, which I'll break down a little bit. Um, later, but here, so on the one side, like we've mentioned, uh, typically these come with the vault um, made of cement, and then there's a casket made of various materials, 
And this is typically in a highly managed kind of lawn scape. Um, and bodies are typically embalmed, almost always. And then contrast that with green burial, which basically just tries to get rid of most of those things. So no embalming, um, though apparently there is some green embalming fluid. So ideally one day all embalming that takes place will be green, um, which is kind of encouraging, but typically there's no embalming. Um, and basically all the materials used are biodegradable. So maybe that's wicker or wood, casket or um, cotton or linen shroud, um, nothing if you want. Um, and this is in a much more natural setting. So you're not necessarily maintaining a lawn, you're just kind of maintaining something else that is a bit more, more natural. And uh, the markers tend to have a little bit more natural aesthetic too, a little bit more unobtrusive, discreet. Maybe it's a tree, maybe it's a stone um, or just GPS coordinates. So here's a nice graphic we worked on that is kind of, um, a, a scale for the impact of um, environmental trade-offs or consequences, costs. And so on the one side, we have conventional burial, which is primarily negative when you're just thinking of the environment. Um, and then we have cremation, which is much less so, but still it's not really doing the environment any favors. Um, there are some costs to it. And then even much less than that, aquamation, which has not really taken off yet, but which, um, for example, Desmond Tutu, who recently passed away, this was his method of choice. Um, then here in the middle, kind of neutral, and at the least, is natural burial. So it just seeks to kind of not do a lot of these things um, and, and let the, the body degrade in, in the natural way, but you don't necessarily have to do much more than that. So neutral kind of at least. And then there are some other things that are really pushing cultural boundaries a lot more, kind of like cremation was originally, um, but such things as uh, human composting, which they're trying to get going in places like Seattle. And this would be considered slightly positive because the end result of that, um, kind of like cremated remains, you can sprout, um, sprinkle around, but it's essentially nutrient rich soil and it doesn't take up any land. Um, so a little positive. And then he's still legal in Michigan, right? Yeah. So that one's still complicated. No options for that yet. But essentially, you can do the same thing by just <laughs> having natural burial. Um, uh, and then we have conservation burial, which is natural burial, but it combines natural burial kind of and uses it as a means for conservation. So this is on the, the positive side of things because there is a, a net benefit to the environment. Um, and then, so here's a little bit more detail about conservation burial. And there's kind of four components of it that various people may value more or less, but um, essentially it lets mother nature do what mother nature does best. And that is let you naturally return to the earth. Um, another component of it is you are literally enriching the soil, adding to the organic com um, component there. So there are some climate and biodiversity benefits. Um, it's a beautiful memorial place to visit for, for friends and family. Um, many people, like it's kind of hard to get everyone to agree on issues about climate change, but it's really not that hard to get people to agree that like a forest is beautiful or that we value nature and we like to spend time in nature. Because, um, and, and studies have shown that like stepping out into a forest it's, it's relaxing, it's calming, it clears the mind, it literally boosts the immune system. And um, many people just kind of appreciate the aesthetics of it. So it's a beautiful place. And then kind of the, the fourth component there um, really is the conservation bit of it. And it helps create this enduring natural asset for the community. So even if you don't have anyone buried there or you're not going to be buried there, it's essentially a nature preserve that can be used recreationally and can provide um, ecosystem services to the broader community kind of in perpetuity. Uh, so lots of benefits there. Um, and this, this really, I wanna kind of put it into a, a larger perspective here or conservation burial can be seen as uh, joining part of something bigger. And there's these two, I guess, projects 
that uh, are based on books that I, I would recommend reading. One of them is Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Talmy. And he basically describes all the benefits of using native plants in, in landscaping. And so probably a number of you are familiar with it, especially with the work that um, CUS has done on their own property. But he has this um, idea based on the premise that most land in America is privately owned. So if, if more of that could be kind of set aside to hold space for nature um, by growing more native plants, um, then eventually one day this could kind of be considered the, the largest national park in the country and this would be called homegrown national park and there if you visit this site you can if you have a little patch of native habitat maybe like a pocket prairie or something you can add your little spot to that bit on the map and it calculates the the quantity and and one day um maybe that will be quite large and it's kind of fun to see that grow so another thing here is the half earth project or a, a book called half earth by eo wilson who recently passed away as well and he was really, I don't know, um, one of the most prominent uh, naturalists and, and biologists of our time. And his, his idea was that humanity really needs this kind of grand epic goal in order to achieve something grand. And, and for him, that is protecting half of the earth for the rest of life and by those calculations, about 80% of biodiversity can be saved, including humans. So um, conservation, pretty yeah, pretty important. <laughs> um, conservation burial can in a little way be part of this, especially you know, thinking back to that map of all those cemeteries across the US, um, like they're just kind of everywhere. And if more of them could, could be contributing to these sort of big, huge grand and ideas that would be pretty cool. It's something that excites me. Um, but yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the, the status of green burial in the US. So again, green burial is kind of this umbrella term. And then there's a green burial council that offers certifications uh, for three different um, tiers of green burial. At the top tier is the, the conservation burial grounds, which is what we're most interested in. And currently there are 16 of those in the US. The very first one was in 1998. So this has been um, growing really over the last couple of decades. And then uh, this one has like, properties have to be greater than 20 acres and they have to um, permanently conserve the land and that sort of thing. Natural burial, a little bit less stringent. Um, maybe they're smaller than 20 acres or something like that, but there's about 58 of those. And uh, there's actually a couple in Michigan. They're on the east side of the state near Detroit. Um, but actually, I should say there's no conservation burial grounds in Michigan, but there do happen to be three of these 16 in Ohio. So not too far away. Um, and then by far the most are these primarily pre-established cemeteries. Basically they're regular cemeteries that have incorporated a green um, section to them. And Michigan has a number of these. On the east side of the state, apparently there's a couple in, in or near Muskegon. Yeah, they, yeah. And then there's the one in Granville. And then Steve there's mentioned. fortunately the one in Granville. So that, that's kind of cool that we have one nearby. Um, but yeah, why are, why are we here talking to you about this? <laughs> <laughs> so we have started this uh, My Burial. Michigan Burial, West Michigan Burial Forest Preserve idea. We have a website I encourage you to check out. We have a survey. If you have any uh, thoughts or ideas, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, please do contribute to that. Um, Many of you already have, which is wonderful. Thank you for that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, now I want to just kind of go through some photos that are some of properties that we have kind of explored working towards this and then other places that have been already established and give you an idea of what this can look like. And then kind of sprinkled throughout there, there are some quotes from people who have responded to these surveys that kind of capture general sentiments that, that people seem to appreciate. So um, 
Do you want to read the quote? Sure. <laughs> so this is someone age 30 from here in Grand Rapids. And she said, I was thinking how depressing a regular cemetery is, but families would be a little more at peace walking through a forest. So she was reflecting on her grandfather's death and um, just really was struck by this idea of visiting him in the forest, um, visiting his memorial in the forest and how that may feel really different to her. Um, and then this is an image of a property that we walked. We're actively looking for properties right now. So this is an image of a property that we walked recently. Obviously not that recently because well, it wasn't snowy. Actually, this is the summer. This is the first property I walked more than oh, okay. a year ago with this express intent of like assessing it <laughs> for a burial forest. And at the back, there was this nice beech tree. And it was 16 acres, about 40 minutes away from Grand Rapids. And we weren't in a position then to, you know, jump on a property and it, it sold pretty quickly, but it was, it was a pretty nice place. So, um, go, ahead. go on to the next one. So, so this is, if you, if y'all haven't heard of Larkspur Conservation, this is definitely an Instagram and Facebook account to follow. Um, they have been active for a number of years now and they have a conservation burial ground there and lots of imagery um, to help the public understand what this looks like and or what it can look like. But this is just, to me, an incredibly gorgeous coffin um, that was obviously handmade out of natural materials. Um, and yeah, so it, the next couple images will show more from this particular place in Tennessee. Um, but yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of room for personal touch mm -hmm. in, in this um, natural burial movement. So here's another quote from someone age 80 here in Grand Rapids. And she said, green burial, green burial appeals to my faith and my desire for a simple ceremony. I feel that natural burial best reflects my faith and wishes. And then here we have kind of the, the standard pine wood box. Um, and it can be as simple or as um, complicated as you right. like. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Both in terms of the aesthetics of the actual materials, but also in terms of the ceremony and um, gathering that happens around the burial. So it, you know, can look simple and casual like this image shows or all of the pomp and circumstance can be part of things. So it leaves a lot of room for that kind of individualization too. Obviously a fairly recent one. Yeah, masked. By the mask. <laughs> so here, yeah, here are some other images just to give you an idea of types of caskets um, or co I guess coffins. I don't even know which word we're supposed to use, but um, these are both made of wicker. I, we've noticed in imagery that a lot of flowers are used, which is quite, quite beautiful. And then here's another preserve in Florida. Um, so this shows the mound that's created when you do a green burial because the earth will settle. So the, the earth is mounded up and that's just a different aesthetic that I think we'll get used to as this happens more and more. After a couple of years that completely subsides so right so yeah here uh natural burial under pine needles amongst the palmetto right here's another quote this one is from um, a guy in Grand Rapids who's 35 he says my desire to I desire to have my body be a benefit to the earth after I'm gone instead of remaining behind with inorganic material um this I guess we could also point out that our survey that we have put out into the world has gotten close to a hundred responses so far. Um, and the middle age, like 50% of people who have answered the survey are younger than 40 and 50% are older than 40 with a range from like 20 to 85. Um, so that's pretty, pretty cool to us that we've had such a range of interest in terms of age. And these are all local people. Go ahead. Another one from Florida. Um, I love the cart. Hope, yeah. Hope to have one of those someday. <laughs> so, right. We hope to use, well, it's, you know, everything's kind of still in the planning stages, but we really like the idea of using a cart like this rather than something that is motorized. Um, yeah, it seems like fitting. <laughs> 
And then another quote from someone age 65, I love the natural and conservation aspect of natural burial. It also seems more personal for all involved. So yeah, again, um, kind of a key component of the natural burial movement has kind of been to bring families back into the process. So you, don't, you don't have to be participant if you don't want to be, but there, there is definitely the, the room for that if, if you like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, more pictures of properties that we have explored um, let you know a little bit of what we've been looking at. So both of these were surrounded by large tracts of national forest. And uh, the one on the left, I was there just a week ago. And this is a tributary of the Pier Marquette. So it was kind of far away, about an hour and 40 minutes. But this is a, a salmon spawning stream, so pretty cool. And there's these beautiful evergreens all along it. But unfortunately, all 40 acres of it was essentially swamp, <laughs> um, but surrounded by nice rolling hills. This was another property um, about an hour away by the, the White River, I believe, overlooking at it. It was high and dry, but uh, and 20 acres. But unfortunately, while we were walking it, we were notified or informed that it had sold. <laughs> That was really depressing. Yeah. A realtor called while we were in the woods. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Another one of our favorites. This was about 40 minutes away. This is the one we call the one that got away because we were in love with it, but we weren't quite ready to purchase at the time. And it was sold, a, I don't know, a month after we set our hearts on it. So yeah, I visited a couple of times. It was about 40 acres and um, maybe only 20 of them high and dry, but right between two lakes, north and south, so. So it was gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. views. It already it had fun. beautiful trails. It was, it was really a perfect place. <laughs> and then this one um, we explored, this was about an hour away as well, fairly open, oak, pine, um, 80 acres, great price, but unfortunately it had terrible access. So. <laughs> and access is pretty important. We want people to be able to get to it easily and have places to put their vehicles. <laughs> yeah, ideally we're looking for something that is somewhat close to Grand Rapids, maybe an hour away, um, because the closer you get tends to be the more weedy things are, which would be an opportunity for restoration, um, but it isn't, isn't necessarily as initially beautiful. Um, but closer to Grand Rapids you are also the more expensive things are. So there's a lot of things to look for. So especially if you do have ideas, again, contact us. We're, we're happy to talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is actually the last slide. So I want to wrap up with a little bit of a personal story. Um, so I grew up in the Philippines. My, my parents were missionaries there. And then I, I came to Calvin College and eventually Annika and I got married and we had the opportunity to go back to the Philippines for a couple of years. And while we were there, um, fairly early on in a pregnancy, we experienced a loss. And of course, that was quite hard for us. But um, it seemed very appropriate to hold a little ceremony in the forest reserve where I was doing my research. And um, in this reserve, we, we did it in a location that was kind of in this grove of metanilla, which was uh, one of the species that I was studying particularly. Still is studying. Yeah, still still working on this group. <laughs> um, but it was very special to us to have basically this protected spot in this world where, you know, kind of holding that memory and those hopes and dreams. And then in addition to that, having this kind of living memorial um, sort of associated with this plant species. So then two years later, here we are in Florida at a botanic garden, and that is our um, first child, Lyndon, and we're introducing her to the exact same species where we had had that little cemetery back in the Philippines. So this is Metanilla miniata, and that was very meaningful for us too. So just kind of thinking about that, like this is something that I kind of want for myself, like to be buried in a nature preserve, a natural burial, and then have some sort of living memorial like a tree associated with me, just kind of seems like what I want and what we want to be able to offer to other people as well. Um, so recently I, I was reading this book called, Is the Cemetery Dead? And it was written by a historian that kind of chronicled the, the role of the American cemetery 
through time. And to that question that he asked, uh, in the context of conservation burial, I would definitely say, no, the cemetery is not dead. The cemetery is alive. <laughs> so um, with that, I think we can, yeah, answer any questions. questions. Looks like some. How are we doing on time? I don't really know how long you have us for, so. Um, I think we can go as long as, as you guys are willing to and people are still asking questions. Cool. So are yeah, you... there are, there are a few in, in, yeah, there are a few questions in the chat. So first one is, uh, could COS do this with the land we have? Um, I, I, we did some research on that, but I'd be interested to hear your perspective, uh, Peter and Annika, what do you think about that? Yes, I, I think you could if you wanted to. I don't um, see why it would be too complicated as long as you had uh, people who wanted to manage that. So yeah. yeah, it's just kind of up to the people there. And that's what we found out too, is that you know we were somewhat surprised that the city of Kentwood said, yeah, you can do that if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some issues. You know, Somebody would have to monitor where all those graves are and make sure you're not disturbing an, an existing grave when you put in a new one. And then also just the logistics of digging the holes and things like that. Yeah. Right. So most people are kind of, um, or at least many people are surprised that there aren't actually that many rules around burial. Like you don't have to be buried in a casket. You don't have to be buried in a vault. You don't have to be embalmed. Most of these rules are just kind of individual cemetery rules for their own operations. So it is fairly easy to um, set up a traditional cemetery, but just kind of do things the natural way. And um, more of the orthodox practices like Judaism and stuff, like all their burials are supposed to be what we'd consider natural. So it really isn't revolutionary or even strange in any way. It's just kind of um, the cool concept of adding natural burial to conservation burial. Um, and, and it makes it, which is kind of weird, like getting excited about something like a cemetery, like you, you wouldn't really think about that, but <laughs> I think conservation burial is something you could get excited about. And I, I hope you do get excited about. <laughs> yeah, Jay had another question too. The first one was from Jay Hedegar um, about uh, using his own land for burial. And I'll just say my own experience with this because we used to live in Cannon Township on a piece of property. And I checked in with the township of Cannon Township and asked them, can I, could I be buried on this property? And at first they were like, you know, like just, why would you want to do that? That kind of thing. But then it was like, yeah, you know what? You can do that. Um, at least for Cannon Township, all it was is I had to, would have had to um, purchase some sort of license that says I'm in some way a cemetery. So I imagine yeah. that depends on the, on the jurisdiction. But Basically there's a permit that you can apply for. And there's some restrictions on, on how big that can be. Like, I don't think it can be bigger than an acre of your land. Um, but yeah, if, if you go through the right avenues, you can do that on private land. And that's one thing that we have thought about offering um, in the meantime, as we're getting this burial forest established is helping people navigate that process if that's something that they're interested in, since there are a lot of questions about it and, um, you know, we have resources to help people figure that kind of stuff out. And I think that that could be something that we offer in the future. Yeah, another thing that um, might be surprising to some people, but most national parks, again, if you apply for a permit, um, allow you to scatter cremated remains in them. Um, so that doesn't really come along with like the official cemetery record and that sort of thing. But um, there are options for scattering on public lands and it is another kind of service we've considered um, helping with at least, because even if you're, you're kind of maybe interred somewhere else off property, if there's a fee associated with that, it could still ultimately help with conservation and setting up like an actual property for conservation burial and like full body burial. So cremation and full body burial, like they don't have to be these totally opposite things. Like you can, have cremated remains on conservation burial sites. You can buy plots, you can be memorialized by a tree, like that can still support conservation and they do go very well, nice hand in hand, especially 
something like aquamation, which has very little impact, um, incorporating that into a conservation burial ground seems like um, a sustainable way to actually work. Hey, Peter, you mentioned a, a one acre uh, minimum on private land. Is that a state thing or? I think that was a state thing. Yeah, okay. and I would have to check that and stuff. I, I think there were some, some size restrictions because once it's designated kind of officially as a cemetery, I think there's tax implications and stuff. Like you don't necessarily have to pay taxes on it because it's undevelopable. So if you like planted somebody in the corner of your property and then declared your whole property <laughs> non-taxable, then people might take issue with that. <laughs> okay. All right, next question is from, um... Looks like Dave Cucci, um, he's asking about the Land Conservancy of West Michigan. And is this something they'd be interested in? So can you talk about your experience with those guys? Um, it is something they are interested in, in um, helping. So as part of, or in order to establish a conservation burial ground, like part of that is um, having some sort of deed restriction or conservation easement placed on your property. So in that case, in a conservation easement, we would definitely have to work with something like the Land Conservancy of West Michigan, and they would hold that easement for us. And maybe um, like far out into the future, once it's full, or once we're done with it, like they could, this property could be given to them and they could take over um, management to the property. Um, but also recently, well, Steve kind of set this up, but I, I talked to Justin Helsinga over there and Essentially, they're going to keep an eye out for properties. We're going to keep an eye out for properties next to their properties. There was a very small one that was right next to Brower Lake Nature Preserve that wouldn't have very many years of use in it, but it was really nice because it was contiguous with this 63-acre property. Um, so I really liked that idea. So there are opportunities to work with it, but it's kind of complicated because they're a nonprofit business. And... Um, combining these two things is a little bit hard. So on basically any existing properties, not gonna happen because there's um, like donor intent and, and that sort of thing, but um, maybe new properties, there's definitely room for working together. Yeah, okay. And then from Ben Vedevich, um, is there any consensus on how far is too far from Grand Rapids? Well, this is one of the, the things we're most interested in on those surveys, <laughs> um, but it generally seems that most people, I think 70 something yeah. percent feel that an hour away is okay. And then like 40 some, maybe 40% felt like more than an hour was okay. Um, and then fewer pe people thought 35 or 40 minutes. So I don't know, we're kind of generally looking for an hour because- Or less, yeah. Yeah, hour less would be great, but somewhere in around the hour might be the most feasible. Great. Uh, Jay Callis asks, can you talk about how the National Home Funeral Alliance fits in this movement? Um, no, I can't really. <laughs> I don't know much about yeah, it. Yeah, maybe you can. <laughs> okay, um, and then Tom Schwanda, what happens if you die in the winter? You can't bury the body immediately. Where would you store the body? So, you could, I mean, potentially have it stored, but um, there are ways to dig in the winter and there are ways to kind of pre-prepare sites. Like you can mound them with lots of compost and stuff and the ground temperature it, itself doesn't necessarily always freeze very solidly. So it is a complication, but it's, it's something you can get around. Um, Okay, uh, Peter Bogart asks, uh, what role do funeral directors play in the process? In Michigan, they play a pretty important role. So some, every state is different. Um, like families are allowed to transport bodies and stuff, but in Michigan for burial, you actually have to have a funeral director present. Um, so for home funerals and, and for the whole process, like a funeral director would have to be involved at least at, at some point uh, to kind of oversee everything. So yeah, there would be the costs associated with burial. And then there would also be the costs associated with the funeral home that you work with. There are a few funeral homes in the area that are certified by this Green Burial Council so they can do green um, funerals. And then obviously once we got established, we would make um, connections with people that knew how to deal with us 
and um, kind of go from there. Would you would you guys become funeral directors yourselves or not? I've looked into it. Um, so I've been in school for a very long time. Like 30, <laughs> 30 some years. Um, and basically it, it's a four year degree and wow. it includes uh, a year long um, practicum. So no is the answer basically, that Peter. <laughs> basically as a mortician, which I don't want to be. So, <laughs> and okay. I don't need him to be in school another five years. So, so. yeah, it, it's complicated. <laughs> it would be great if I was, um, but I don't think I will be. Okay. And it looks like I misspoke um, the, for the private land. It's, it's a uh, one acre maximum. Okay. Correct. Versus minimum. Is that right? Yeah. Maximum. Maximum. Okay, good. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Virginia Van Andel. Um, if you were to get your forest burial site going, what approximate costs would a family encounter for burying a couple? Uh, well, we've looked at various prices. Um, other places are charging to kind of see what they feel like they need to, to function. And it's it's all over the place. And it largely does depend on, on location and, and how nice the property is and that sort of stuff. But kind of average cost for burial in general like plot and opening closing services across the US is about $3,000. So that's our um, price that we have kind of surveyed. Uh, vast majority of people feel that that's appropriate. And there are other conservation burials um, grounds that charge about that much. So we feel like that's probably reasonable as well. So that's kind of our target as well. So that would include the plot and then the, the burial itself. It also happens to be about the going rate for a home birth midwife, and I kind of love that parallel. Yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, then a suggestion, you should also include Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy um, yeah. as, a, as a group to connect with. Yeah, so depending on the location, whether we're south or north, or, or even uh, there's one towards Lansing as well, I think mid-Michigan um, would kind of dictate which conservancy would best be best to... Uh, partners okay. okay and then another uh, um, clarification about what funeral directors do they have to sign the death certificate um, yep. among other things um, have you and then Jenny asks have you considered uh, oops I just scroll past me here considered uh, having interested people donate to purchasing property um, that would be awesome we don't know anyone who wants to but yeah I mean part of why we're happy to talk to you and stuff is, is getting the word out and, and maybe eventually there would be somebody who does have property that would want to be involved in this because a lot of the ways that like land conservancies get their properties is people have land and they want it to be conserved and it, it gets into the system that way. So um, the bigger our community can be, the more likely we are to secure a nice place that is accessible and beautiful and, and can really do this well. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, yeah. we have a we have a certain budget that we're ready to go with. Um, but you know, like we said, all of these things with location, size, um, aesthetics can obviously all be better if we have more. Um, so yeah, certainly open to that conversation if anyone is interested in going talking more about that. Yeah, and you do have a donate button on your site, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so if people want to do donate to help you raise money to do this, you can do that today. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, John asked, "Well, how would you like to partner with us at Sea West? What what can we do to support your project? What are you open to? <laughs> <laughs> we have been we're very grateful that you've given us the opportunity to." talk with you about this. I think raising awareness is huge. Education around this concept is huge. And then obviously also just locally having people that know that this is something that we are doing and um, people who are invested in the concept supporting us with obviously monetary um, <laughs> things is great, but also talking about us to people that you know and yeah, raising awareness about the project. I think that's all really great. Yeah, so we are at this point at least interested in partners and there's a couple of other people who have 
expressed interest in maybe partnering with us, which we're kind of in, we've set talks up with. Um, investment seems a little bit more complicated because there's normally this association of being paid back with interest. And um, it, it seems like this is a viable business option, but we don't really know. And maybe things are slow and, and that sort of thing. So getting saddled with like a lot of expectations from the beginning seems a little bit stressful, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, someone, yeah, someone else just asked a question too about raising funds by pre-purchasing a burial site. So that that's absolutely something that will be part of the business plan. What we have felt constrained by at this point is that um, we don't have the actual property yet. And if people are willing, I mean, maybe that's, yeah, go ahead. I'll take the baby, Peter will talk. <laughs> so actually, you're not officially allowed to sell a plot in a cemetery unless you are totally officially set up as a cemetery. And part of being set up as a cemetery is um, obviously you have the land, you have been okayed by the cemetery commission, um, which means you've been okayed by the, the township and everything. And you have this $50,000 endowment fund um, that you contribute to as you sell, sell plots and stuff. But until that fund is in place, you can't really pre-sell anything. So there could be donations, but they can't actually be plots. So one thing that um, maybe once we have property, like a really goal to kind of rally people around would be like establishing this endowment fund of $50,000 so we can actually get off the ground and then start functioning. So that's that's kind of a, a nice thing that maybe people could contribute to as well. Okay, great. Um, John Considine has a clarification or a question about the Brower Lake property. So you mentioned 20 acre minimum, and that was only five or six acres. Um, would that work for you? So yeah, there is a caveat. Like if it's contiguous with already preserved land, you can have a minimum of five acres. Ah, okay. So, yeah, if you're right next to something, you can be smaller than 20. Um, if you're standalone, then it's minimum of 20. Uh, okay, then another question from Ben. Is there time, if there's time, uh, uh, does the window of time between death and burial need to be fairly short for natural conservation of burial? I know it, bodies begin to be degrade. Yeah, it, it usually is. Um, funeral homes and stuff do have refrigeration units and dry ice is often used and stuff. So yes, it, it typically is pretty quick, but it doesn't have to be immediate. And it, it kind of depends on who you're working with. Yeah. And then, of course, there is the option of cremation and, and doing things at any other point in, in the future, but um, it's, it's not necessarily as natural as some people want. Okay. Yeah. Would you be a nonprofit once you're up and running? Um, at this point, we're, we're not thinking of nonprofit, but we're definitely open to that because nonprofit, you know, requires a board and um, that sort of thing. And it, it seemed like it might be a little bit more complicated, but um, definitely not out of the, the question. And it would make donations easier because people uh, could get that tax benefit. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rich Van Houten asked, would, it, would a signed intent to purchase help? Possibly. I would, um, yeah, have to look into that. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the last question. Last question we have here is give us an idea of who would be ready to put money down. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you need permission from neighbors for this use of property? Um, so yeah, there are zoning things, and it, it's normally handled by the township. So in in the one property that we kind of got to that point with, uh, we had set up a meeting with the township, and then basically they okay it, and then they open it up to neighbors. And then you kind of have to sell the neighbors on it as well. So it could be complicated. And, and like, so some of those complications are if you're just going to the open market to buy some land, you might have to quickly make a decision on something and then, you know, spend a lot of time and then eventually figure out that there's some, some people in the neighborhood who really, really don't want this for some reason. Um, I mean, I don't know. Keeping, keeping a forest in your backyard that's already a forest doesn't sound so bad to me, but obviously that <laughs> things can get way more complicated than that. So it, it would be nice if 
you know, maybe there's somebody who wants to sell to conservation and things can, can happen kind of before. Be, happen before the actual sale and we can pre approve some of these things before we go through stuff. So yeah, there are a lot of things to consider and it depends on every property. Every property is different. Yeah, and, and probably part of that is um, making sure that people are educated and understand what you're trying to yeah. do. And, yeah. Um, and let, uh, as you said, Annika, we're, we're just uh, um, really interested in keep carrying on this conversation with you and then helping you get the word out about this too. If not, if, I mean, I think we can do more than that, but at least that. So we've got, recorded this conversation and we'll post this somewhere yep. so that COS members can see it, but we'll also go more broadly than that if you want. Maybe you can put it on your website or whatever, whatever works you think is going to work. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, well, I was thinking too that we would share it with Sherman Street where we're members. Um, because I think there would be a lot of people there interested in watching this too. Yeah, yeah. And I mentioned this before to you guys, but you know, when I do these presentations about the Climate Witness Project at churches and I mentioned Green Burial, that's always the thing that's most interesting to people. It just kind of mm -hmm. fascinates me, but there's a lot of interest in this among churches. So that's a really good thing. Yep. Yeah. So um, I don't see any other questions, so we probably should wrap up. I, I did want to thank you guys. I mean, I, this has just so exceeded my expectations. It's such a beautiful presentation, these photographs, and you obviously have done your, your homework. You know what you're talking about. So it was just wonderful to have you. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Our pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. We make a good team. <laughs> you too. And we also happen to love working together, which has been really a blessing. Yeah, it's been great. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> So just a, a last chance, does anybody have anything else they wanna uh, ask uh, Peter and Annika while they're still on or we can wrap it up here? Okay, thanks again. Um, yeah, Sorry. Go ahead, Peter. Um, one thing, I guess about state laws, I, I see some comments and stuff in there. So like I mentioned, there is the state law about having this $50,000 mm -hmm. endowment fund, which basically makes startup costs 50,000 more dollars than, than it could be. But if you are associated with an established um, institution like a church, then you don't have to have that. So there are benefits to partnering with people. And there is possibility to waive that fee. It, for example, maybe if it is a conservation burial grounds and the intent is for it to just be a natural space that doesn't require mowing for all of eternity, um, then you know, still there would be some costs, but maybe it wouldn't have to be as, as much. Wonderful. Okay, thanks again so, so much for you guys. Really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, figured out. Well,